This is the Decoding Obesity Podcast, where we simplify, demystify, and decode obesity, helping you lose weight and feel great. So gear up for a fascinating journey through this ever-evolving field, and let's see what we find. And please remember that the thoughts and opinions on this podcast do not constitute medical advice. Don't forget to visit our website, www.decodingobesity.com, for show notes and more info. And now, here's your host of the Decoding Obesity Podcast, Dr. Avishkar Sabarwal. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Decoding Obesity Podcast. Today, I have another amazing physician who is here to share her weight loss journey. Dr. Maria Maldonado is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She's a primary care physician and is both certified in obesity medicine. Her research and clinical interests are in cross-cultural care and healthcare disparities, implicit bias, medical education, and the delivery of patient-centered care. Before we begin, listeners, please hit the subscribe button wherever you're listening. This way, you can get notified as soon as the new episodes are released. Welcome to my podcast, Maria, and thank you for coming on. Hi, it's nice to be here. So uh, when did your weight loss actually, or when did your weight become an issue for you, um, you know, in your life? Well, I think for those of us who struggle with weight loss, um, we've probably struggled with uh, uh, weight our entire life, right? It's it's just... Um, I think you'll hear from most of us that uh, we have lost and gained weight many times over our lives. So I, I would say that it was almost a lifelong struggle for me. I see. But when did it really become an issue for you? When do you think it really went out of control when you thought that, you know, this is the time now I really need to do something about this? Um, you know, I don't know if it was, <clears throat> I don't know if this was. Um, a point in time where I just thought, oh my goodness, I'm just so afraid or so nervous that I need to do something about this. It, you know, th- it didn't quite go like that. Um, this particular weight loss journey that I've been on really started in March of 2019. And um, at that time, I was at what you would call class um, two, uh, what you call in the medical uh, world of class two obesity. And um, prior to that, I'd become very interested in the principles of um, weight management. And this was something that I really enjoyed talking about with my patients. Uh, But I have to say that I felt like a real fraud because there I was in class two obesity having conversations (laughs) with my patients about this. And to top that off, I had become aware of a study that showed that uh, physicians who were heavier than their patients had less of a likelihood to be having these conversations with their patients. And I had a real need to, um, I have a real need for integrity. And it occurred to me that I really needed to take this very seriously. And um, in about March of 2019, I came across um, a web page uh, that had to do with physician, women physician physicians who are interested in losing weight. And it was through that particular um, uh, web page or Facebook group that I became introduced to this physician that was called Katrina Ubell. And everybody was raving about her. And I learned about her podcast and I just started to listen. And wow. that's really where it began. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard amazing stories of, you know, how, what people have, um, what people have achieved when they've worked with Katrina Ubell. So, um, so that's very, very interesting. So, uh, what did you do in March 2019? Uh, you know, how did you implement what she was talking about? Was it like a mindset change, or was it um, like uh, a, a change in your in your diet, or what exactly was it? Because she does a lot of mind work. I know. Yes. Yes. You know, and it's so interesting. Um, I would say that all of the other times in my life that I've lost weight, I've always been successful, right? But I obviously didn't lose the weight permanently. You know, invariably the weight would creep back on. And when I started listening to Dr. Ubell's podcast, 
she started talking about something that I thought was really revolutionary. And it was this thought model um, that she had learned from her coach, uh, Brooke Casillo. And essentially, this thought model really taught me how our thinking creates our outcomes. And I have to say that I've always known that, but I've always known that in a very unconscious way. Um, You know, I'd never really thought about it, um, but I'd always known that everything in our life begins with a thought. So, for example, if, um, you know, the outcome of my daughter, for example, began with a thought that said it would be nice to have a child. And I was excited about having a child. And that obviously motivated me to take certain actions that I won't talk about on your podcast in order to have the outcome of having this wonderful daughter that I have today. And so I learned about this thought model and it occurred to me that I could use the success that I had enjoyed in other areas of my life. And number one being um, going to medical school and becoming a physician. And I began to think that if I could have a thought that I wanted to be a doctor and take those consistent actions that you needed to take in order to be successful, if I could do that over all the years that had that went into becoming a physician, that losing weight was actually something that I could do and that I could do it really easily and that I could apply those principles that I had applied to going to medical school into uh, losing weight. And that's really where it began. I began to be very curious about this process and I began to engender very positive emotions around this concept of losing weight. So rather than seeing it as weight loss is is going to be, I'm going to be suffering uh, deprivation. Um, I am not going to have fun during this process. You know, what's what's the point of living if I can't eat all of the things like that kind of thinking was really what led me to take the actions of not doing anything to lose weight. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that because, um, you know, th- that's what I try to um, tell people that it's not a diet that you go on. It is a lifestyle change that you go into and you yes. have to imbibe that into you that this is a lifestyle change which is good for you and rather than having a food centered idea of a diet or a lifestyle you have to look at other aspects of your life that may be more important than just concentrating on the food aspect and the deprivation that you'll go through and whatever have you and it necessarily does not have to be a deprivation because there are so many other things that you can still enjoy even in food and you have to enjoy them in moderation essentially Um, And that should help as far as the lifestyle uh, changes go. But, you know, you've uh, you've obviously tried several things multiple times. Did you try different types of diet or was it the same thing that you would do again and again for, say, a particular event that you had to go to and then uh, you would just bounce back? Or uh, was it uh, different types of diets? Yeah, so um, one one time in my life where I was very successful at losing a lot of weight was in my early 20s. And at that time, I didn't realize it then, but I was engaging in intermittent fasting. <laughs> I was eating one meal a day and um, and actually I was allowing myself to eat whatever I wanted for that one meal a day. Um, and I was quite successful at that time at losing the weight. Um, and um, But I didn't do anything about my mindset at that time. And so the weight would just come on. And probably about two years ago, I became introduced to Dr. Jason Fung's approach uh, to intermittent fasting. And I read I read his book, you know, The Obesity Code. And at first I was very cynical about it. I said, of course, you're going to lose weight because you're not eating a lot of calories. So what's what's really the big deal? Right. And I didn't really take it, um, you know, sort of very seriously. but this time around, I decided that I would implement the principles of intermittent fasting, and I would, um, and I would also implement the pro- you know the practice of cutting out sugar, and cutting out refined uh, flour from my diet. And I did not see this in terms of I'm going to be depriving myself. I I looked at it at what are all the other things that I could be eating 
And so in this process, I, I sort of look at, I went through three phases of my, you know, my diet protocol. You know, the first phase was um, a high fat, low carb diet. And that to me was very exciting because, you know, at that point I was eating bacon and I was eating sausages and I was eating cheese and I was eating lots of olive oil and blue cheese dressing. And I, you know, like really what's not to love about all of those things. And I was doing it in the context of intermittent uh, fasting and I wasn't snacking. I just said, you know, you're not going to snack. And, um, and I found that I was, that I was pretty successful. Um, but I found that I was not losing the, the weight that I wanted to lose. And so I made an adjustment and I changed to healthy, high fat, lower sugar diet. And I started cutting out bacon and, you know, all of those things that I thought was, were not healthy for me. And I started implementing more things like avocados and nuts and, uh, things like that. And I then went through a new phase, which was to become mostly vegetarian and vegan. And, you know, for the first time in my life, I found that I was able to sort of use my body as an experiment, right? Just to see what was going to happen, right? And I was not tied so much to success that all of it was just learning. So if my weight stayed the same, I, I kind of looked at it like, oh, this is interesting. Nothing is changing. Can I make a tiny change? And then I would do that, and then I would see what would happen. You know, it's it's very interesting. My patients are very aware of how much weight I've lost. So I'll walk in the rooms. If somebody hasn't seen me in a year, they're like, oh, my God, what did you do? And I said, <laughs> I, said I did all of the things that I tell all of you to do. <laughs> but this time, this time, I, I saw it as a choice, right? Because autonomy is really important. You know, we need to realize that we can do whatever we want to do. Like I could continue eating all the things. I could continue engaging in all of the actions I was taking to continue to gain weight. That's fine if I want that. But I wanted a different outcome. I wanted a different outcome. So I had to make a change. That's true. Actually, um, the way I look at it is that the motivation has to be internal, but the motivation has to be tied to something external to really have a long lasting change. Yes. But that has it, to come from within. If somebody tries to force you to do it, that's never going to work. That, in, that motivation has to come from within, but you always have to tie it to something external. Um, like, why are you trying to achieve that goal? It has to be something much more important than, you know, just for looking good or whatever have you like for example staying staying on this earth for a longer time to to enjoy your family being more healthy to enjoy time with your kids um things like that and that really drives people to kind of take steps to improve their health and uh this is not to say that people have not tried or people don't try it's just to say that uh you know this is this makes them try for a longer time and this mm -hmm. makes them seek the right help that they need. Um, and, you know, to say, okay, this has not worked for me and I need to do something for it. Yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, uh, Maria, there's, uh, whenever anybody is losing weight, there is this uh, thing in our heads. Okay, I want to look a certain way and this is the amount of weight that I want to lose. Did you ever have that, that I want to get to this X weight and then you would not get to it and you would get despondent and then you would try to you know, do something else or just give up? Did you ever have that? And did that change over time for you? Yeah. So, um, I was very clear of what my outcome, the outcome that I wanted, the outcome that I wanted. And, and again, um, this is Katrina Ubell's like sort of thinking, um, that you get to a mid range BMI. Right. And for me, I wanted to get to a mid-range BMI, and or at least I wanted to get into a normal range BMI because as a physician, I felt like I wanted to model, um, you know, sort of a, what was considered a healthy weight. And, um, and so I had the mindset that this was something that I could achieve, that I just had to hit upon what was going to be the right approach to, to doing that. Um, and so, 
uh, the way that I looked at it is that I, I said, this is what I want my outcome to be. These are the actions that I want to take. Here's how I'm going to have to be feeling in order to take those actions. And here are the thoughts that I'm going to have. And, you know, conventional thinking tells us, um, so I am well into the, the world of middle age and upper middle age, you know, fast approaching that those senior sort of years. And, you know, conventional thinking says it's really hard when you get older. It's really hard to lose weight. You know, the goal is not going to be to get to a normal weight. You've had a lifetime of doing these kinds of things. And so I challenged that kind of thinking. And I just said, you could do whatever it is that you want to do. You just have to hit upon the right actions. Um, and I did and I have achieved a normal body mass index. Um, I wanted a certain size of clothing. And it's interesting, the si I've achieved the size of clothing that I wanted to be in without achieving the mid-range BMI. So right now I'm sort of in this phase of really saying, well, what do I really want? What, you know, so I have some ambivalence right now. And that ambivalence that I'm having is what's responsible for me not achieving my mid-range BMI right now. And I'm very aware of that. And um, and I'm really okay with that because this time, you know, the question for me has been, do you, do I want to lose weight for the last time or do I just want to lose weight for this one time? So I want to, I'm doing this for the last time. I'm not interested in losing 80 pounds again in my life, right? I've lost this 80 pounds. True. And, and maybe I'd like to lose an additional 10 pounds. Um, and I'm not interested in ever getting back to that other thing. It, it is a light, it is a lifestyle change. And that is because I've changed my mindset. And that is because I have the belief that I can achieve what I want to achieve. And, and here's the thing, you know, when I work with patients, all of my patients have achieved something important in their lives. They just haven't realized it. You know, so my patients have bought houses, they've had children, they've gone to school, um, they had a goal that they really wanted. And we talk about what were the actions they took, how were they feeling about it? Um, and all of the times they talk about those feelings of excitement they had at achieving the thing that they wanted. And that was because this was something that was so important to them. So, for example, I know somebody who um, built from the ground their own business over years, and it's a very successful business, but they were struggling with weight. And when we drew the connection between what they did to achieve that business and how they had everything inside of them to do this, it changed everything for that person. No, that's very true. You know, people talk about willpower in terms of uh, patients who are suffering from obesity and they talk about the fact that uh, they're lazy, but that necessarily is not the case. There are so many highly successful people who are still suffering from obesity and that's where the shift in the mindset has to come. It they need not necessarily be, um, you know, uh, a fault of theirs per se if they're not losing weight. There are so many other factors that go into this you know, the whole weight Absolutely. loss journey that everybody goes through. Uh, before we go further, I just want to remind our listeners to subscribe to the podcast. Listeners, it really helps if you can take just a few minutes to leave a review as well. Let us know how we are doing and what you want to hear uh, in the f uh, future episodes. Okay, so let's dive back in, uh, Maria. So how did you do it this time? I know we talked about the lifestyle change, but, uh, you know, let's just get to the very, uh, into the granular details of how you actually did it. What lifestyle changes did you make that helped you lose yeah. your 80 pounds? Uh, yeah. So um, I mentioned earlier that I just did all of those things uh, that they tell you you're supposed to do. Um, so I employed tools of food journaling, right? You know, they say that people who keep track of what they eat are 50% more likely to lose weight than those who didn't. Um, I just thought I didn't have enough time to do things like that. Um, uh, but all I did was just like recorded sort of the bare essentials of what I was eating. I didn't record how much I was eating of it. 
But if I only ate one peanut, that ended up on my food journal list. And I actually can tell you everything that I've eaten since March of 2019. It's recorded on my on my phone in the notes section. Um, I also uh, planned what I was going to eat 24 hours in advance. Um, I think that that's really important for you to make decisions about what you're going to eat. Um, while your uh, uh, brain, your executive brain is in control as opposed to your very hungry child brain that just wants to eat right away. Um, and I found that that was very helpful. And what I would do is just stick to whatever I said I was going to eat. And if the day came and I felt like I didn't want to eat what was what I had planned the day before, I just tell myself, it's okay. You can eat it tomorrow. You can put it on your list tomorrow. And I started simplifying things to the point where 20 a week in advance, I have a pretty good idea of what I'm going to be eating for the rest of the week. And I bring that list with me to the supermarket each week. Um, and that has taken out a lot of the food chatter that was in my brain. What am I going to eat? I'm hungry. I should eat this. I shouldn't eat that. What do I have a taste for? Um, in that process, I really learned that food, in fact, was meant to nourish us and was not meant to be a source of excitement and uh, pleasure, really, <laughs> which, was a, which was a very new concept for me. Um, you know, I thought like food is the spice of life and, you know, we're <laughs> supposed to be so excited about it. And when I started reframing my thoughts around that, um, I started looking for other sources of pleasure in my life, right? You know, uh, what were the sources of pleasure in my life that didn't have anything at all to do with food? What were the things that I could actually uh, do? And so that was very um, helpful. Um, the other tool that I did that was very different than what I'd done before was I started to weigh myself every day. And I started to release myself from either the joy or, you know, um, the disappointment that I would, you know, that I used to feel when I'd step on the scale. So you'd step on the scale and it didn't change. And I would just be like, oh, my God, that's so awful. And this time around, I was just like, oh, that's really interesting. I wonder what that could mean. Maybe that was in relation to something I ate. And I now know that certain foods I eat, when I get on the scale the next day, there's going to be an increase in the scale. And that's just the way that it is because it's water retention or, you know, I, I just have really started to look at this as just an experiment of, about what is going to work for me. and. Um, I just really also, I've talked a lot about that mindset, uh, but I really practice the tools of self-compassion and self-care and realizing that um, one, one of my favorite affirmations that I have is I have all the time I need to take care of myself. I used to not believe that. I used to believe that I didn't have enough time to cook for myself, right? Um, I didn't have enough time to do any physical activity. I didn't have enough time uh, to journal. I didn't have enough time to meditate. And now I realize that if I don't engage in self-care, that I don't have the energy or the appropriate attitude that I really need to face all of the challenges that I have in my life. Um, and so I, I really do practice the uh, principles of, of self-care and self-compassion. And that has been so great. You know, one of the things that I did at the very onset of this journey is I told myself that I was perfect just the way that I was at that time. And that I was making changes because I wanted to have my life be even more of what I wanted. Right. And ironically, when you stop with uh, you know self recrimination and blaming and calling yourself names like I'm so weak I, why can't I do this or that ironically that's where you begin to find the energy for this particular journal not journey um, I think you said something earlier on about um, uh, willpower and what I learned is that willpower only works for a short period of time 
Um, I've heard it said that willpower is like a muscle that, you know, you use. And if you resist something, you're like, no, 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 I, I, I'm not going to eat that. 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 After a while, just like if you're pushing against something that's very heavy, you're going to get tired. You know, your muscles can, can only take but so much. So I also learned to stop resisting when I wanted something. I just said, yeah, you want it. Of course you want it. <laughs> of course you want to eat that. Who, who wouldn't want to eat all of the chocolate? You know, who wouldn't want to eat all of those things? And it's okay that you want it. And you know what? I don't think it's going to serve you. So yeah. maybe you're not going to eat that today. And it, it's okay. You know, in the way that we sort of talk to our children, right? You right. know, our children want to go around and they want to eat like all of the desserts, you know, and they don't <laughs> want to eat the vegetables. And we don't say to them, of course you want it. You, you know, you don't want to eat that candy. You don't want to eat that candy. You want to eat all of the vegetables. You don't say that. You say, yeah, I know you want to eat that ice cream, you know, before dinner, but that's not really a good idea because, you know, your body is growing and, you know, you need to be strong. So this is what we do to take care of our bodies. And, um, you know, we, we can have that, we can have that planned treat, but first we need to make sure that we're really nourishing your body. How I think about you, that? You, yeah, I think you said it very well. Actually, uh, one of the guests on my previous uh, episodes actually said it's more about skill power and not willpower. And I think yes. that's so true because having these tools uh, in your armor, so to say, uh, you know, planning ahead, shopping for your food when you're full rather than when you're hungry. Uh, these are certain skills, small things that you can do that really will go a long way. Self-compassion. Uh, you know, and uh, having supportive uh, people around you who can support you in your journey rather than all the negatives, uh, you know, that you face around it. There's a lot of negativity around everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think finding a very positive environment is also very essential. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the challenges that you faced in your journey? And, you know, what were your key factors in your success? I know you've, you've talked so much about the mindset change. And to me, it looks like that was kind of, you know, one of the key factors. But was there anything else other than this mindset change that really caused you to get success? And what challenges have you faced since March of last year? And how have you overcome those challenges? Yeah, um, you know, there are times, you know, I don't want to give the impression that this has been smooth sailing and I have acted perfectly and I've done everything that I said that I was going to do, right? Um, there are times that I've just like sort of fallen off. Um, I, I went to, ironically, a uh, overcoming obesity conference, <laughs> <laughs> an academic conference, the food that was at that conference, I mean, it was healthy food. They didn't have any bread hanging around, but oh my goodness, there was food all over the place. And then when you walked into the exhibit halls, uh, there were all these protein bars and chocolate shakes and all of these things. And I, I was not prepared for that. And I, I went around eating everything and I just, I just couldn't believe it. And I came home and I gained five pounds and I said, this is, this is, this is crazy. Um, but in the past, had something like that happened, that would have skidded into, well, I've fallen off. So that's the end of it. You're right. I'm not going to continue on in this journey. This is like really too hard. This, I just want to eat everything that I want to eat. But what I used this is, was an opportunity to sort of get in touch with what was going on. And, um, you know, Obviously, I was in this environment where there was all this food. This was not going to be the first time that this was going to happen. And so I realized that I was going to be, I was going to have to plan the next time that that happened. And in addition, I was going to have to think about the things that would be helpful um, in supporting me when I was in an environment like that. So you talked about supportive environments. Um, one of the things that I do if I walk into a party, or I walk into a, an event where there's all this food after I, I, I initially plan what it is that I'm going to eat, right? And what it is that I'm going to allow myself to eat and what's going to be okay. Um, and if I've made the decision that I'm going to keep up with my avoiding flour, for example, I will make some new friends at this event and I'll say, you know, 
I'm really, you know, not <laughs> eating flour uh, these days. And, you know, there's all this wonderful things here and I'm just like not going to do it. And I'd really appreciate if you just kind of look out for me. Like, I, I feel very comfortable and this may not be something that's comfortable for everybody, but I am so transparent about this process um, that, you know, I'll just tell people, you know, I used to, I would never in a million years, you know, if I had lost 80 pounds, let's say 10 years ago, I never in a million years would have told anybody that I had done that because it would have meant admitting that I was 80 pounds overweight. Now I'm just like, yeah, that's, that's who I was. That person, I love that person. She's all right with me. And, you know, um, I can just like sort of talk about that process in a way that is not, you know, um, judgmental or anything like that. And I can, I can gain support, uh, from other people. Um, last, last June, I went on a vacation with my family to Puerto Rico. Right. And at that point I had already lost 20 pounds and I decided that I didn't want to, you know, come back from that trip and gain another five to 10 pounds. And so I was very transparent with my family about, you know, what was going on. And it, you know, there was a lot of resistance. They were just like, it's a vacation. You only live once. We're in Puerto Rico. Right. We're this and that. Um, but I really stuck to what I wanted for myself. Right. And it's so interesting. A lot of this is about where you put yourself on this list of priorities. Right. Right. It's about a so, priority that you have. Yeah. Yeah. So many of us are like, well, my family doesn't eat this food and I have to have this and I have to have that. And, you know, um, there's not enough time to do all of these things. Um, but what if there were enough times to do that? What, right. That's what, so true. Yeah. Right. What if there were? What would that look like? Yeah, I think a couple of points that I would want to make here um, are. Of course, you know, you have to prioritize There's Everybody has 24 hours. You have to see how you're going to use those 24 hours, um, whether it's going to be for yourself or you're going to, you know, put yourself lower down in the list of your priorities. Um, and that's how you decide what you want to do, uh, you know, in terms of your health, sleep, um, diet, whatever. The other thing I want to mention is that, you know, whenever you go to parties, that's that was the case with me that. I was always excited about the food that's going to be there. I think shifting the focus from food to being in a social environment and socializing with others, keeping that as a priority rather than the food mm -hmm. that you're going to eat would be a much better focus. And that really helped me in that, uh, in that aspect because once the food is out of the center of your attention and your attention is on socializing and having that social connection, I think that really helps when you're going to the party that that resistance that you're facing in the brain that I should not be eating this and I should be eating this, that really goes away because your focus now is not food, but it's the people that are around you. And basically yes. the whole goal of going to a party is not to eat food, but to socialize with people. The third thing I, I want to say is, yeah. The third thing I want to say is that uh, if you're going to a party and you know you're you're gonna still feel that that tension in your mind, that conflict in your mind, I would say just eat something at home and then go. And that'll just keep you full throughout the party. And, and you know, that takes care of that part of um, your mind telling you that, you know, that inner struggle that you have, whether I should eat this or should not eat this, you're already full. So just eat before you go. And it's, it's, um, it's funny that a lot of times, at least, you know, uh, in, not in our generation, not in my generation, but like my grandparents and whatever, in their generation, a lot of times they would just eat food at home and then go and socialize. I, I used to find it very odd when I was younger. Like I would have these elderly people coming in and they were like, we've already eaten and then we've come. I was like, why did they eat and come? But it makes <laughs> so much sense because, you know, once you've had that food, that focus of food goes away. Yes. And you're focusing on socializing with people, which is also very, very important in your overall health. Yes. So yeah, I think that's uh, that's really key in understanding how you you handle um, the parties and you handle your vacation. The, the the other thing that I wanted to actually bring to uh, bring to focus was the fact that you mentioned that you were measuring your weight every day, and I want our listeners to understand that your weight changes even during the day. Your weight will change, even if you may measure it twice a day, thrice a day. The weight will change. That mm -hmm. does not mean that you know you suddenly gained one pound or two pounds. Yes, you have, but that's transient. And so the overall trajectory has to be in the right direction. 
uh, mm-hmm. and does not necessarily mean that you know you have you were X amount um, on one day and the next day you're a little higher. That does not mean that you fail. It's just the way the body works. Whatever you eat, it may retain a little bit of water. It may lose a little bit of water. It just depends on what you've eaten. But overall, it it has to be a downward journey. So a lot of times, uh, you know, what we try to encourage is not to measure the weight every day. You can do it for sure, but you have to be cognizant of the fact that it will change um, from one day to the next. But if you do it weekly, um, that's that's okay too, because overall you're just trying to see a downward trend. And you're not necessarily looking at those fluctuations and getting exasperated and frustrated with those fluctuations. Yes. Yeah. You know, it, it, as you say, I think that's a very important point. I, I think um, it's important to to lose the, you know, sort of emotional connection to what's going on with the scale, you know, and just let it be what it's supposed to give you, which is just numbers on a scale. Right. And I think gauging from that... Is. Yeah, and I think gauging from the fact that, you know, just instead of attaching emotions to the number, attaching the science or an understanding of the fact that I ate this and this caused it to be this would probably be much more beneficial. You might think, okay, so this is what's causing it to happen. Maybe what if I don't try this and try something else and see what that does to the weighing scale? And, exactly. you know, looking at it from a kid's perspective, so to say, being very inquisitive about how yes. it changes, um, I think that might help rather than attaching these emotions. And a lot of times people do get very hooked on the weight. It's not just the weight. It's also your body fat percentage, your muscle mm-hmm. mass, other things that change. So it need even if your weight does not budge on the scale, even if you're still following a healthy lifestyle, that is still going to be much more beneficial for you than not trying anything at all. Absolutely. I completely agree. Right. Looking so, at the progress you've made yeah. rather than looking at what, what hasn't gone well. Right. So, uh, so Maria, before we close, do you have any advice or any tips for people who are having these struggles? Um, and how, how do you counsel your patients and their families in terms of you know the person who's struggling from obesity and how they can find support um, in their journey. Yeah, um, I, 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 you know, it's it's very interesting because it's different for for um, for everybody. You know, I really do think that it starts that journey really starts with you. It really does. Um, if you you may or may not be able to garner support you know, with, from your family and friends. It all depends on what those kinds of circumstances are. Um, but there are there are um, lots of groups that, that are available for people to be um, connected to. Um, you know, there are coaches that can help people uh, to do this. Um, coaching, though, is not going to be for everybody because coaching can be very expensive and not, not a tool that everybody is going to have access to. Um, but I think... You know, there are a number of podcasts that you can listen to on a regular basis that can begin to give you those kinds of tools and tips uh, to help to help get that to help get that support. So I think podcasts like yours, where you can get information. Um, there are podcasts for people who want to lose a hundred pounds, and they sort of talk about all of these different tools or tips. Um, I think there are lots of books that you can read. Um, I actually did not ever get a, a coach to do this. This was this was a very I listened to these podcasts that were available for free. So there's a lot of free resources that I think that are out there. Um, but it's important to practice the principles. You can't just listen to them. You have to actually act them out. Um, but I think once we decide to make a change, things begin to alter around us, right? So we always begin with ourselves. I I would recommend that people start with a with the question of what do I want for myself? When I imagine myself 10 years down the road, what does that look like? What would really make me happy? Right? You know, dreaming about what that could possibly be like for you and then allowing yourself to believe that this is a possibility. Right? And That's true, yeah. And then finding finding the right the right physician 
you know, not all of us are going to help people appropriately, right? We haven't really learned how to, you know, this is changing. I think we're learning how to do this better. Um, but our approach has really been like, you know, eat less, move more. And that's not the whole picture. It's it's a lot more complicated than that. So so finding a partner, I think, you know, um, uh, you know, starting with your physician, uh, you know, who has the appropriate approach to this, I think can be can be a very helpful thing. I agree. I think uh, while your social circle does play a very, very big role in how you approach your weight loss and your motivation, I think in this day and age of social media, it can be a boon and a bane depending on how you deal with it and how you handle it. You can be, uh, you know, surrounded by people who are posting negative comments, which should never be the case. Uh, yes. You know, people should be supportive. But at the same time, you can be a part of these supportive groups, which are there, which are all free, essentially, whether mm-hmm. be it, you know, any any social media platform, you can find support in so many of these groups. So, you know, while all of us look for support from people who are closest to us, our immediate family, um, our, our, our spouses, our boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever have you, sometimes it may not necessarily happen. Mm-hmm. and that should not hold you back from achieving what you're wanting to achieve because there is still enough support out there. And once you start gathering or garnering that support from these external sources, and once you start your journey, sometimes it takes a while for the people who are close to you to understand what you're going through. And it may just come from a place of their belief system on about what they believe. For example, when you were in Puerto Rico, your family mentioned you're on a vacation and you know just you just live only once and this and that, but that point of view was very different from what your point of view was. And to understand and accept your point of view, it may take a little while for your family or your close ones to understand what you're going through. Uh, but once they start seeing that you're really motivated and you're getting this support from outside, I think none of our close ones want something bad for us it's just yeah. their point of view is different and your point of view is different but just hoping for the fact that they'll come and support you may not be very beneficial if you're not finding support there because you have to understand there is support available everywhere around you um, i would just say that try to look for support where you can find it start there i i, I completely agree um one thing though that i would i would want to leave the listeners with is the most important relationship that we have is the one with ourselves right and really learning to be your own true best friend in all that that means <clears throat> and that sounds a little bit like you know sort of new ageish to say something like that but when you start this process and you realize how you may have been treating yourself and you decide, you know what, I think I'm going to treat myself a little bit better and you grow to sort of enjoy that process, that becomes an unshakable relationship. And then it begins to just sort of bleed into all of the relationships that we have with other people. And that becomes that 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 becomes captivating, I think, to other people also. I think we really teach other people how to treat us. Right, right, right. right. And so that process really begins with us. So start with yourself. You know, right, and I, yeah, I think it's it's very important to understand that, you know, in the way the tradition the current way of practicing medicine, the onus falls on the physician to help the the patient but the way it has always been in the past and the way i personally feel it should be is that we have to be an equal party in this yes the onus cannot be on the physician only because you know you can only take the horse to the to the lake or to the pond the horse still has to drink the water himself yes yes and 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 it is a bidirectional it's so bidirectional right Right. So we just have to decide if this is something we want. Right. Uh, I'm by no means trying to say that, you know, we uh, that 
the physicians don't have a role in this. The physicians have a very crucial role in guiding you in the right direction. And mm-hmm. sometimes you will hit roadblocks just like anybody would. Even the yeah. best athletes have coaches and physicians are essentially there to help you to look at your picture from an outside perspective and see where you're facing these roadblocks and how we can help you. Sometimes it may be changing the way you get support. Sometimes it may be with medications. Sometimes it may be with surgery. Sometimes it may be with changing your lifestyle. But that's where the physician's role comes in. But taking all of this information in and actually working on it still lies on the patient. The onus lies on the patient. Yes. Right. So uh, listeners, don't forget to drop us a review or a comment. If there's any specific topic that you want us to discuss, please let me know. You can write to me at host at decodingobesity.com and do subscribe for more fun and inspiring episodes like this one. I am looking for more inspiring stories. And uh, if you have one to share, then please do email me at host at decodingobesity.com. That's all we have time for today. Thank you so much, uh, Maria, for joining us and sharing your wonderful story. Um, And I'll see you all next time. A pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to the Decoding Obesity Podcast. Please remember, the information in this podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely of the host and his guests and do not constitute medical advice. Views and opinions on this show do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of any organization. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you so much for listening in. Don't forget to visit our website, www.decodingobesity.com for show notes and more info. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please feel free to rate, review, and subscribe on your preferred podcast listening platform. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.